Back in the early 60s, the scientists identified this unusual star that you see right here. A star that was extremely bright, but was also bright in a lot of other spectra, including radio spectrum. Something that never happened with any of the other stars we've discovered anywhere. So something was causing this particular star to emit a lot of radio waves, along with other frequencies as well. And so in 1963, these objects were officially named quasi-stellar objects. Not really a star, kinda like stars. Today we know them as quasars. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and in this video we're going to be discussing a few more things we've recently learned about quasars, including the first one ever discovered, answering some questions in regards to the formation of these objects, and also in regards to the most common feature they all have. The enormous astrophysical jets that can often be thousands if not millions of light years across. With some of the longest ones discovered so far, discussed in one of the videos in the description. But when it comes to the original observations of quasars, it didn't really take long to explain exactly what's going on here. Today we know that all of this is caused by supermassive black holes in the middle that don't just create accretion disks around themselves, they actually end up creating these enormous structures of surrounding gas that ends up emitting a lot of different frequencies, with these enormous structures also resulting in extremely powerful galactic winds, which also produce a lot of other additional effects as well with these effects being so powerful that they become visible billions of light years across. You can technically see them from the edge of the universe. But how exactly some galaxies transition into the squeezer stage is still actually a bit of a mystery. In other words, it's not entirely clear what conditions a galaxy must have in order to turn into a super bright quasar and not just an active galaxy such as a Seifert galaxy. For example, nearby Centauri C that you see right here contains a lot of the features of a typical quasar but it's difficult to call it a quasar because it's not really that bright. It's bright in some frequencies, but definitely not in all frequencies, and definitely doesn't produce enough light to be qualified as a quasar. But obviously not all quasars are the same. There's actually a super rare type of a quasar, that's sometimes referred to as a hot dog, which stands for hot, dust obscure galaxies. Essentially kind of like a quasar-like objects, that also have quite a lot of gas around them, that often acts like a quasar but also extremely bright in the infrared spectrum. And these particular types of galaxies are also generally rare, approximately one in every 3000, which implies that they actually don't last very long. And so some scientists actually think that a typical hot dog, or a dust obscure galaxy, is kind of like a baby quasar. It's what quasars usually start as, before they become more developed, and before they start to produce a lot of light for millions of years. Here's an example of one of these hot dogs visible in the infrared, compared to a lot of other quasars that are not as visible and do not produce as much infrared light. And so in that sense, by understanding how these hot dogs work, we can maybe start understanding how quasars form as well. And so in a relatively recent study, the scientists explored this quasar or this hot dog that you see right here. And this is actually one of the brightest and the most massive quasars discovered so far, with the light coming from an extremely early part of the universe around 1 billion years after the beginning of the universe. We're essentially representing a potential baby quasar being created in front of our eyes. But what exactly is happening here, and what's producing all of this light? Well, one of the first discoveries here was that this was a very dense region, approximately 10 times as dense as the average universe. Implying, of course, that there's a lot of dust here, a lot of different types of matter, and just way more of everything than you usually find in a typical galaxy. But then further and more detailed observations started to reveal something else. The scientists started to also reveal additional partners or additional galaxies that seem to be orbiting around the center. And so they actually resolved at least 24 smaller galaxies that were extremely close to the central hot dog and seem to be moving around this galaxy relatively fast. You can actually see the velocity graph right here with some things moving faster than 1000 km per second. Which kind of implied several things. First of all, it implied that this was an extremely active and very dense region with a lot of gas, a lot of galaxies, a lot of stars, a lot of everything really, just orbiting around a central region. With the central hot dog or the central galaxy not particularly being disturbed by this, but being fed by all of it. All of this gas in falling into the central region would sort of serve as all of the material needed for the central massive black hole to then start emitting all of these powerful emissions visible from far away. And more importantly, the recent observations and calculations were able to determine their exact position in three dimensions, essentially confirming that they're orbiting around the center and very likely are feeding the central galaxy. 
And on top of this, the central galaxy is already at least 10 times as massive as the Milky Way, even though the universe is still extremely young. In other words, it just found itself in a situation or in conditions where there's just a lot of gas suddenly providing a lot of materials for the central black hole to become extremely bright and extremely powerful. Something that, for example, we don't really find around any galaxies nearby, such as the galaxy you see right here, Centaurus A, implying that these quasars very likely involve major galactic collisions and mergers, and not just one or two, but possibly a dozen all at once, with all of this happening at an extremely high rate. Something that we definitely expect in the early universe, but something that's very uncommon in the more modern universe, and that's exactly why we don't really see a lot of quasars anymore. Although in this case, because the central galaxy is much more massive and much larger than its partners, it doesn't really get affected by it as much. They just get absorbed, they also introduce a lot of new mass and a lot of new matter, and make the galaxy grow larger. But they don't really disrupt it in any other major way. Although in this case, because this is the first such observation of an ancient galaxy surrounded by 24 different partners, it does make it a pretty interesting discovery. In this case, at a redshift of 3.6, this is the most distant such object ever discovered. But obviously, one of the main reasons we even see these objects is really because of those super powerful jets, almost pointing directly at us. And even today, we still don't really know exactly how these particular jets are formed. Although more and more studies suggest that it has very little to do with the actual black hole, but has a lot to do with the accretion disk and the torus around the black hole, and very likely huge magnetic fields all of this forms. And so a lot of new observations from the first quasar ever discovered, the quasar known as 3C273, the quasar that's about 2.5 billion light years away from us, but that also contains a jet that's approximately 200,000 light years across, does actually hint that the black hole might not have anything to do with the jet itself. And this recent study you can find in the description explains it in a little bit more detail. So in a nutshell, here's what the scientists found. In this case, because this jet is extremely well visible in various radio frequencies, they were able to map it across a relatively large area of space. In the process of discovering that the jet remains very straight and doesn't change its shape for an extremely long distance. In more scientific terms, it remains collimated for a very long period of time. Or basically the jet remains straight for thousands of light years until it finally starts to break apart. And in this case, the narrow part of the jet stays straight for over 100,000 light years, way past the point where the black hole dominates space. Which in this case implies a really important fact. The jets seem to be independent of the black hole's gravity. The jets are dominated by something entirely different, very likely something created around the accretion disk and the torus as I mentioned before, and most likely some kind of a magnetic field produced by all of this all at once although it's quite likely that the actual explanation is a little bit more complex and is still beyond our comprehension. More importantly, it confirms that the shape of the jet is more or less independent of the galaxy or the black hole that launched it. It seems to depend on some other factors, very likely related to all of the gas and all of the mass orbiting the black hole itself. In other words, we can expect an even smaller black hole to produce an extremely long and powerful jet, as long as it has the right type of an accretion disk and the right material orbiting around it. And since some of these jets are millions of light years across, and actually produce some of the largest structures in the universe, it makes this one of those mysteries that we still have trouble answering. As a matter of fact, one of the many mysteries discovered about the jets, including the one from this particular galaxy, is that they tend to form these unusual knots, separated by areas with very weak emissions in between them, almost resembling some kind of a wave with crests in it. So maybe something like this. But at the moment, nobody really knows what's really happening here, because as I mentioned before, we still have very, very poor understanding of how these structures form and what exactly dominates their activity when it comes to distances in thousands and millions of light years away from the black hole. It could be some kind of a magnetic field, but it could also be some kind of a phenomenon we still don't understand very well. What it is, how it works, all of it is still a mystery. We will talk more about this once more studies come out, once we understand this better, and once more observations are made in the future. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.